so in this session we're going to be looking at the sixth trumpet which is of course the last trumpet we want to look at in detail because the seventh trumpet contains the vials so we'll look at the seventh trumpet when we consider the vials so the sixth trumpet is recorded for us in Revelation 9 verses 13 to 21 just a reminder we looked at the first four trumpets which brought about the collapse of the western part of the Roman Empire and then we looked at the fifth trumpet which destroyed the uh, the Middle East and North Africa and now we're looking at the sixth trumpet which is going to destroy uh, the area that we now know as Turkey and Greece that area of the Empire So we read, the sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God. Now we've come across this idea before, uh, back in chapter 8. If we go back to chapter 8 of the prophecy, and just read there, uh, verse 3, uh, this is when the seventh seal had been opened. So chapter 8 and verse 3. And another angel came and stood at the altar, having a golden censer. And there was given unto him much incense, that he should offer it with the prayers of the saints, upon the golden altar which is before the throne. And the smoke of the incense which came with the prayers of the saints ascended up before God out of the angel's hand. And the angel took the censer and filled it with fire of the altar, and cut it into the earth, and there were voices, and thunderings, and lightnings, and an earthquake. So here we, in these verses we see that the angel of the altar, the golden altar, had a censer, and he offered the incense along with the prayers of the saints. Of course incense is a symbol of prayer, isn't it? And it's verse 5 that tells us what the result of that was. There was an earthquake. Now fitting that section into the historical context, we know what happened. The true believers were suffering persecution um, at the hands of the emperor of the uh, Roman Empire. And a new emperor arose, Julian, who decided to try and bring the empire back to paganism because it had just been turned to Christianity. And what Julian did was to proclaim toleration to all Christians, whatever their, whatever their colour, as it were. And this brought uh, relief to the Christians, uh, the true Christians, who were suffering in the empire at this stage. Now, although we're not told that it's the same situation that we've got here in chapter 9, it possibly is, and that's why we are told it's the angel of the golden altar. We're saying, loosing the angels in verse 14 brought judgment to the Eastern Empire, and we shall see that as we go along, and possible relief to the true believers who were living there. And this voice said to the sixth angel which had the trumpet, right, that's the angel in overall control of the events of the sixth trumpet. He said to that angel, Loose the four angels which are bound in the great river Euphrates. So here we've got another four angels, and they were the angels controlling the four powers that would cross the river Euphrates and invade the empire. Of course, as far as history is concerned, it's humans that do all this, but the prophecy is telling us that really the angels are in control of all these things and they are determining when things happen and how they happen. Verse 14 says they are bound in the great river Euphrates. That's the authorised version. 
if we look at just about every other version revised version says at the review for 80s RSV the same the New King James at Young's Literal at Diaglot by and it's possibly uh, not the best of things to say in the review phrases because because it sounds as though they're actually in the river they are bound at the river and the the, the Greek word that's used there can actually be translated that way at as well as in so what we're saying is these four angels up until this moment in time were ensuring that the nations they controlled did not cross the review Euphrates, but now they were to loose the nations and allow them to cross the river and to go into the eastern part of the Roman Empire. We see a map here from the Penguin Atlas of World History. Uh, it's rather a busy map, but it shows us the Mongol empires in the 13th and 14th century, as we say, bound at the River Euphrates. If we highlight the River Euphrates, we can see at this stage, these nations had just begun to cross over, actually, the uh, River Euphrates. In fact, if we, if we enlarge that part of the map, we see that the Seljuks had just invaded the Byzantium Empire, the Eastern Roman Empire at this stage. And they were the first of the, the four nations that were going to do that, the Seljuks. We see a map here of the Byzantine Empire as it was in 1025 AD, more or less intact. The arrow shows Constantinople, which is on the uh, western edge of the Bosphorus, that, that narrow waterway which actually divides the empire into two. So what we've got is the uh, western part of the empire and the eastern part of the empire, Anatolia, which we now know roughly as Turkey in modern times. And it's this section, this eastern section, which is going to be affected by the things that we're considering here in the sixth trumpet. If we turn over a few pages in the Penguin Atlas, we see here the... Uh, barbarian nations invading from the west and we see that they are actually crossing over the river Euphrates which we can just pick out on the map there so there were four of them first of all the Seljuk Turks and we saw that on the on the last map on the Penguin Atlas the Mongols, the Tartars, and finally the Ottoman Turks. We've shown them here on the the eastern side of the River Euphrates because one by one they're going to cross over that river, as the prophecy indicates, and attack the um, Byzantine Empire, Anatolia. So. First of all, it was the Seljuk Turks, as we've seen already. The Chronicle of the World here reports Eastern Turkey, August 1071. Asia Minor is at the mercy of the Turks after defeat today of the army of the Byzantine Emperor Romanus IX at Manzikert north of Lake Van. The emperor himself has been captured. This conclusive battle was the result of years of tension between the Armenian and Greek-speaking people of Asia Minor and the Turkish nomads infiltrating from the east with their flocks. Earlier this year, 
the new emperor resolved to drive the Turks out and raise a large army for the purpose. The Turks appealed for help to the Seljuk Sultan Alp Arslan, who came in person with his army, and it was the Seljuks that were successful. Here we see a map of their empire, really a vast empire, but it crept into that eastern part of the Byzantine Empire, uh, as the map shows. The pink area shows the territory regained by Byzantium at that time. So, the next nation to invade was the Mongols. Back to the chronicle again. We read here that Genghis Khan is dead. The Mongol captain who carved out the largest empire the world has yet seen. He's died in his camp. And then the chronicle tells us the Mongols have created a vast empire which reaches from the Pacific to the Danube. So here's a map of their empire, indeed a great empire, and it occupied a large uh, surface of the earth. But the prophecy is concerned with the destruction of the eastern part of the Roman Empire and of course we see from the map once again they invaded into that area. So that's the Seljuks, the Mongols, next come the Tartars. We read here again from the Chronicle. The Ottoman Sultan Bayezid is defeated by Tamerlane in battle near Angora. Tamerlane captures Smyrna and reaches the Bosphorus. Tamerlane was the uh, leader of the Tartars. He went as far as the Bosphorus, but he didn't get across there. He only got as far as the eastern side of it. It was the Ottoman Turks that were going to finish the job off, as we shall see next. Here's a map which shows us Tamerlane's empire. Once again, a vast empire, and it was it subjected the uh, Byzantine Empire to Tamerlane's raids. In fact, he took over much of that uh, area uh, later on after after this map. So finally, we come to the. Ottoman Turks, and as we said, they actually crossed the Bosphorus and they attacked and defeated Constantinople. And that was the end, really. Once their capital had been destroyed, that was the end of the Byzantine Empire, the Eastern Roman Empire. We read here, once again from the Chronicle, Constantinople... The capital of the once great Byzantine Empire has fallen to the Ottoman invaders. It is the end of an era. So that was on the 29th of May 1453. The prophecy tells us at verse 15, The four angels were loosed, which were prepared for an hour and a day, and a month, and a year, for to slay the third part of men. Now we've got an interesting time period here, because if we take the day for a year principle, one day obviously is one year. An hour is a twelfth part of a day, and a twelfth part of a year is one month. You might say there are 24 hours in a day. Remember the Jewish day, was 12 hours and their night was divided into watches so it's one twelfth a month is 30 days which 
equates to 30 years. A year is 360 days or 360 years. And if we add all that together, it comes to 391 years, one month. So what the prophecy is telling us, that was the time that these uh, empires uh, that were just considered were attacking and eventually destroyed the Byzantine Empire. Now what we're saying here is, the first of those, the Seljuks, crossed the Euphrates 27th of April 1062. Now I've not been able to find um, concrete evidence of that. When we look at the details, it's obviously got to be close to that year and I suspect it is then because we do know the end of that as we've seen it was the collapse of Constantinople in May 1453. So we've got an example here where we can actually pinpoint the starting point by moving backwards from the, the, the finish point of this prophecy. Um, that is assuming of course it was the beginning was when they crossed the Euphrates, but there must have been some significant event at that time to start this time period off. I suppose it shows us once again, doesn't it, that while that was in process, it was almost impossible to pinpoint the, the closing time. But once it's all over, we can look back and, and do that. So next John says, And the number of the army of the horsemen were two hundred thousand thousand, and I heard the number of them. Now that is obviously a, a, a lot of horsemen, that is. Two hundred million. What we're saying here is it's either the total number of all the armies used by all those great empires during that period of four hundred years. Or maybe it's a way of saying that the number of horsemen were numberless, it was impossible to count them. So John goes on, And thus I saw the horses in the vision, and them that sat on them, having breastplates of fire, and of jacinth, and brimstone. Some versions read there, they have breastplates, etc., the colour of fire, and jacinth and brimstone, which might might be true, it might not, but it does make a bit more sense of, of what what the prophecy is saying here, doesn't it? And then John goes on, and the heads of the horses were as the heads of lions, and out of their mouth issued fire and smoke and brimstone. It's Brother Thomas that suggests here that John is describing not just horses but horse artillery and it was these nations that had actually invented gunpowder gun and they used it to great effect in their wars and they, they used the horses to, to pull the cannons uh, which and it was the cannons that produced the fire, the smoke and the brimstone. John says, by these three, that's the fire, the smoke and the brimstone, was the third part of men killed. And it's that last third that we, we mentioned earlier on. Uh, Anatolia and Greece and that area of the Roman Empire. They were destroyed by the fire, the smoke and the brimstone. John goes on, For the power was in their mouth and in their tails, for their tails were like unto scorpions and had heads, and with them they do hurt. John is describing here something which had never been seen in the world before, uh, th this new invention of the cannon and, and gunpowder and so on. Here we see a Turkish mortar and the crew of men that operate it uh, for doing various things to, to make the, the, the mortar work. So when we 
when John says they had heads and a mouth, well, there's the mouth, and here's the tail, the fuse. The power was in their mouth and in their tails. And, of course, they had to light the fuse at the tail, as it were, before the, the cannon ball would come out of the mouth. And the head, obviously, is around the mouth. So that seems to be what John is describing here um, in verse 19 of the prophecy. We read here, virtually every new military invention was used by the Mongols and with these machines they very quickly developed the modern principles of artillery. So that was what was going on at this time. And then we read at verse 20, The rest of men, which were not killed by these plagues, yet repented not of the works of their hands, that they should not worship devils, and idols of gold and silver and brass and stone and of wood, which neither can see, nor hear, nor walk. Neither repented they of their murders, nor of their sorceries, nor of their fornication, nor of their thefts. Now when we look at the, the details of this, they repented not of worshipping their idols of gold, silver, brass, stone and wood. Now that actually describes the way the Catholics worshipped, as opposed to the way in which they, they worshipped more in the East, the, the Greek Orthodox Church. And we'll, we'll come back to that in a moment. It's the same principle that we see here in Amos, where Yahweh says to Israel, I have smitten you with blasting and mildew when your gardens and your vineyards and your fig trees and your olive trees increased. The palmer worm devoured them. Yet have ye not returned unto me, saith the Lord. And these men didn't return to the worship of the true God either. They wanted to continue worshipping their idols of gold, silver, brass, wood and stone. So thinking about the Roman Empire, 1453 marked the end of it. The western section had been destroyed, North Africa, the Middle East, and now Anatolia, it had all gone. But it hadn't all gone actually, because while those things were happening, while the east was being destroyed, the papacy in the West had found a new source of power, a military power, and so started the Holy Roman Empire in 800 AD, an empire which lasted approximately a thousand years. As one historian puts it, it was a blast to curse the earth for a thousand years. So this Roman beast that Daniel saw it went through different phases and its deadly wound had been healed. Or as we read later on in the prophecy, it's a beast that was and is not and yet is. Of course that happened again because it was um, the Holy Roman Empire came to an end uh, around about 1800 and the Pope lost his power and it was all it was all disbanded yet we know don't we that that power is arising again in the earth uh, as we speak we might ask the question why so much war and bloodshed in this part of the prophecy well there's a simple answer to that really it's simply foretelling the way in which humans, not instructed by the word of God, will behave. Those who are not enlightened. And we've seen various military generals, as it were, with their armies, uh, walking the earth and, uh, and destroying much, well, many people and also much property as well. 
if we just go to Psalm 49 and we are reminded there what it's all about I mean that, that psalm concludes verse 20 man that is in honour and understandeth not is like the beasts that perish so all of those individuals that were considered in this part of the prophecy and all their armies they're all gone they have perished it's only those who were true to the word of God that will live again we read in Psalm 49 verse 6 they that trust in their wealth and boast themselves in the multitude of their riches or we could say in the multitude of their armaments none of them can by any means redeem his brother nor give to God a ransom for him for the redemption of their soul is precious and it ceaseth forever we see in the psalm also verse 11 their inward thought is that their houses shall continue forever that their lands will continue forever but of course they didn't and as verse 12 says again nevertheless man being in honour abideth not he is like the beasts that perish when we consider the prophecy the next chapter in the apocalypse chapter 10 gives a vision of future glory and this is why the prophecy is punctuated with these visions of future glory because if we read all the history in one go it would indeed be a depressing read but we, we are lifted uh, on a number of occasions as we go through the history to be reminded of what it's all about the future glory when the Lord Jesus Christ will return to the earth and we shall consider uh, that section another time